Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Ben Powers coming at you from the Commander's Voice. My guest today is Chief Warrant Officer for retired Kenneth Pete Hill, who was, uh, when I knew him as uh, Second Lieutenant Powers, he was the Battalion Motor Officer uh, for the 82nd Signal Battalion. And it's it's a real honor to have you here today, Chief. Well, thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to uh, speak today. I appreciate it. Now, this is super exciting. Chief has had a career that spanned uh, the Army from the early 70s uh, through the 2000s. He was a, a young soldier. He was an NCO. He was a senior warrant officer. So he's he served uh, throughout the ranks in Europe, Korea, in the Airborne and CONUS. Uh, and also, I believe you were a DA civilian with Army Test and Evaluation Command after you left the active military. So you've seen the Army on a lot of levels, correct, Chief? Yep, that's true. Uh, the majority of my time I spent after I retired was uh, what was called the Army Material Systems Analysis Activity, uh, where I was given an opportunity to work for the Army's premier analytical center. Uh, and we did a lot of work for the uh, for G4. And I'll speak of some of the projects that I had the opportunity to work on as we progressed through the interview. Okay, fantastic. And this is just so everybody knows, this is a little weird for me. I've been, you know, had my little 24 year career. I got into the field gray ranks. Whenever I'm talking with chief, even right now, I feel like second Lieutenant powers and he's going to find something wrong with my trucks. So it's always fun talking with chief. <laughs> so rolling right into it, chief, I had a chance to send you some questions and we kind of dialogued a little bit. So I'm really interested in like, let's go back to Texas in the early seventies. What inspired you to join the military in the first place? Well, I had a wide variety of jobs as a young man. A, a lot of folks don't understand. I left home when I was 13 years old. So I had an early start in life and uh, I went from job to job, but primarily I was a painter. I worked, uh, I first started out, I worked painting regular houses and I worked my way up into the commercial side of it. And uh, I'd done that for almost about five years. And uh, it just finished a major project there in uh, Pasadena, Texas, which is my hometown. I was coming home from work one day and I was tired, I was sweaty, and I'm thinking to myself, there's got to be a better life out there besides painting places in Pasadena. As it was, I went to the local recruiting office, uh, started, uh, actually went to the Marine Corps recruiting office at first, uh, and they went and talked to me. I didn't have a high school uh, diploma, so that crew was out. Not that I really wanted to join the Marines anyway, they're a little strange. But anyway, so uh, going to the Army recruiting office there, and I have very little options. So that, they gave me the opportunity. They set me up to take the ASVAB test. So I came back in about three days, and I took the test. And surprising to me that uh, I scored well enough to where I could enlist. Uh, back then, we had what was called the McNamara's 10,000 program that was out to Vietnam. Uh, the standards were lowered, where if you didn't have a high school diploma, but if you scored high enough on ASPAD, they would allow you to join the Army. I don't know about the other services. I just, I know that was for the Army. Uh, but I didn't have, I had did not have the opportunity to ask for what MOS the Army, you know, for me. So I took the test and I had to actually wait until the end of basic training before I found out exactly what job I was going to have in the Army. If we go back to the recruiting office, I was there. I had taken the test. I had found out I was able to re-enlist. I was watching the airborne tape. And that just really it caught my eye. And I asked the recruiter, I said, can I do that? He said, well, that's primarily up to you if you think you can do it. So I did have the opportunity when I enlisted to sign up for the airborne office. No, oh, that's really cool. So did you, and you went, I'm assuming being a maintenance warrant, uh, was your MOS at the end of basic training, did they assign you to a maintenance ordinance uh, MOS at the time, or did you previously have a different MOS? So how it happened is uh, I went to basic training at Fort Pope, Louisiana. Uh, and at the end of basic, the 
drill sergeant came out and started handing out the MOS. You know, 11B, 11B, 12B, 12B, all the way. We got to my name, and it said Hill 63 Hotel. So being the home of the infantry and being that the drill sergeants were all 11Bs, I asked him, what is this? He said, I have no clue. <laughs> so the drill sergeant had to look it up. Uh, but at that point in time, it was a wheeled vehicle, track vehicle mechanic. Uh, so I that basic training. I had two days off. Fort Polk, I had to report to Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland. That's where I took my advanced individual training in PA 63 Hotel. And uh, that MOS school was uh, 13 weeks long. So I left Aberdeen and uh, reported straight to jump school at Fort Polk. And how was your jump school experience in the, in the early 70s? It was, uh, it was rather rough, I would tell you that. One of the things that surprised me when I got there, we were up in Aberdeen for 13 weeks. We didn't have a regular PT program. You know? We were told, train to be a mechanic because this is a new MOS. They're going to they're gonna throw a lot at you. You really have to study. So the PT wasn't the primary. So the first thing you do when you go to jet school is you get administered the airborne PT test. Well, I passed the PT test, but I failed to weigh in. It was three pounds underweight. Uh, so well, I got through that and I would have to say that it was probably at that point in time, one of the hardest schools uh, that I had been in as far as physically, mentally it was okay, but physically uh, it, it took a while to, to get that tempo to where I could be comfortable with it. Uh, and, and, you know, my jump school was like anybody else's, you had ground week, you had tower week and you had jump week. Roger. And then so off to your first unit of assignment, did, being a wheeled track guy, I'm going to make an assumption you didn't go to an airborne unit right out of jump school because your MOS would be assigned to a, a a heavier unit. What was what was your career path like once you graduated from your initial training? That was an unsafe assumption on your part. <laughs> I left jump school and I got on a bus and came straight to the 82nd Airborne Division. Outstanding. So my first unit of assignment was Delta Company 782nd. And it was a great assignment because I got there in November. The company had just formed in September. So we were a brand new company. It was a revitalate. They changed the MTO after Vietnam. So we actually supported the 3rd Brigade of the 82nd. Uh, so as a hotel, my primary function was working on the engine. Uh, and being a cherry, I got all the uh, premier jobs for the first year that I was there. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I'm cursed with, if you can see the small hands, and I'm sure you remember the Gamma Goat. Roger. Yeah. 80 seconds used the Gamma Goats, kill artillery signal. Well, they decided, they figured out that... that these hands could get up underneath and change the front differentials. So <laughs> that probably became one of my primary functions whenever a front differential came in, give it the heel. So I learned a lot. I would tell you that the NCOs that I had in that unit were all Vietnam veterans. Uh, they were no bullshit there. It was, there's no gray area. I mean, uh, you had a formation, you showed up for formation, you had spit shine boots, you had stress fatigue. Uh, we walked, we didn't march, but we, I personally had, I walked the maintenance shop, changing the coveralls, you know, at the end of the day, got your uniform back on and, you know, carried out your business. But uh, I was blessed where I was raised by some super non-commissioned officers. I was raised by a outstanding, one of the most smartest warrant officers that I've ever had the pleasure of working with in my career. And that, that stands until the day. Man was uh, he, he was such a genius in my eye. Uh, Raymond L. McDaniel, CW4, he's been gone for quite some time now. God bless his soul, but he was my inspiration being a one off. Oh, outstanding. So, were you feeling at that time? Obviously, you're a young soldier. Uh, I'm guessing you're about 19, 20 years old at this point, and you're you're learning your job, you're learning what it's like to be in division. But are you already starting to be like, I want to emulate these people? Maybe this would be a career. This is the kind of officer or NCO I want to be. I would I would tell you that honest to God's truth, after a year of being in the army, 
knew that was going to be my profession. Okay. The two years of being in the Army, I knew that I was going to do everything within my power as far as assignments and training to become a warrant officer. So that warrant officer uh, started me started in 1970. And I actually approached some of my non commissioned officers and I approached my warrant officer and explained to them what I wanted to do. You know, I had, had a long range plan. That I was smart enough to ask for loads of recommendations at that time. And the process in the family was just totally different than the process. Okay. No one at the process for change as part of putting them on packet. Who was I needed to become a one officer? Now, having come in with a good ASVAB score, but not having completed high school, did you have a GED at that time, or did you complete a GED on active duty? Well, that's, that's a uh, that's another great story. Uh, I was in the shop working, and the shop foreman called me over. I was getting ready to make spec four. I was a PSC, getting ready to make spec four. He sat down. He says, he said, how in the hell did you get in the Army without a high school diploma? How in the hell did you become a 63 hotel? So I said, well, I can't help you. The 63 hotel, the Army takes back. You know? <laughs> As far as a high school diploma, and I explained during the process of that I went through, you know, with the standards and all that. Well, uh, Timothy Garfield put me down to the Ed Center that day and signed me up to take to GED. The following week, took me back uh, to the Education Center and got the GED. No, that's outstanding. And so how, how long did you spend in the 782nd on this first tour with the division? Got there in November of 1974, and I left division in May of 1978. Uh, I've been assigned to the Third Arbor Division in Kirkland, Virginia. And at that point, you had made, have you, had you made E5 at that point? Were you a sergeant at that point? Yes, I had made E5. I, I was very fortunate, as I said earlier, uh, the MOS was a new MOS. It was an old MOS that they brought back and revitalized. So I had the opportunity, I made E5 in two years. Oh, wow. So, yeah, when I left Fort Bragg, we were squatted there, but that's how you, it's a normal progression. When I got into Germany, the project brought me in, I was speaking with him, and he said, and we went through the whole gamut of what my background was, what my experience was, and things of that nature. Yeah, he said, well, you're the headquarters for two, so I said, okay, that's fine with me. No, natural progression is quality. You can move up to potential. So I walk out to the company and my quality is a ridiculous. <laughs> so I walk back in and the first time and I said, first time I got a problem here. He said, what's the problem, Neil? I said, the quality is a ridiculous. He says, yes, and, and you're the producer. Go so do your job. That was my introduction to uh, leadership 101. <laughs> Roger that. Probably the best leadership laboratory somebody could have. It, it taught me it taught me well and it helped me throughout my entire career, not only as a senior non commissioned officer, but as a warrant officer as well. I mean, dealt with the problems of an early age, learned how to mitigate them as I progressed. So when you got to third armor division, you're in Europe, it's you know, Cold War, you know, People worry about the war start packed, you know, fighting in the fold the gap, all the all the stuff we hear about the Cold War. What was what was the atmosphere like compared to the 82nd Airborne Division? The work was totally different because the 82nd we had an 18 hour mission still back then. Uh, we knew that we had to be ready to go. We had to have our bags packed. We did we did an exercise once a week, once a month. The 82nd, we did a lot of small built-up exercises. I got into the third armor division, we would spend uh almost nine months out of the year in the field prepping for that invasion that never came. We were close to the Folder Gap. That was one of our primary missions was the Gap. You know that I had M60 tanks back then. They rode over the M1 since I left but the op tempo was hard, but in a different way. 
and you had to get a different mindset got what was the quality of soldier like did you find a soldier as a soldier or did the guys who volunteered for airborne were a little bit different oh my god what a different uh things that my ncos taught me to do show up in uniform before the before the formation you have starts to fees, you got highly spit shampoo your hair is uh, germany and i have to caveat this i can only speak the units that I went through, but I can't say it is a blanket statement. But the, the units that I went with, it took a lot to get the soldiers to sew They wanted to do their job. I mean, not, nothing from that. They, you know, I had truck drivers that were great truck drivers. They couldn't make formation. You no, know, I had clerks that were great clerks. That's all they wanted to do. They didn't want to do PT. They didn't want, didn't want to do soldier things first. So it took me a while. Especially as as a, as a young platoon sergeant, get them to understand that you know, our job is only half of our function. Soldiers for soldiers always, and then doing your job efficiently secondary. So I tried to work them hand in hand. So what a morale problem uh, in Germany, and we had a big growth problem in Germany. You know, middle part of the city. And it was a uh, there's sometimes it, it is uh, some, some long, long training day. Say the least. No, understood. Now, you, so you're in a leadership role at a very dynamic time for the Army. The uh, you alluded to McNamara's ten thousand at the beginning of the interview. Uh, we're, as we start rolling into the 80s and you have the Reagan White House taken over and there's a push to improve national defense, there's a push to improve the quality of the Army. Uh, are you starting to see a brighter soldier come in or a more motivated soldier come in as you are progressing through the leadership ranks? Or uh, what What did the Reagan era change about the Army as you were going through your career? I think the biggest change that Reagan gave us was hope. We lived through President Carter, and President Carter, uh, no disrespect intended to the office of president, but he wasn't a military friendly guy. I can remember President Carter was the only time in my entire 28 years that we never got the uh, annual rate. It was uh, 75 or 76, we didn't get a rate. Uh, so when, when Reagan took over, it just like a whole brush of right there. I mean, he, he him being in office changed the outlook soldiering for us. So as we progressed, did the soldiers get better? Yeah, the soldiers got better. Or maybe soldiers got more in tune to the training, were willing to do more with command. And they didn't have that doom and gloom over their head all the time, but not knowing what was going to happen to them. I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but no, I'm just looking for your your experiences, Chief. This this is fantastic. Now, since you had been motivated to, you know, the second year in the army, you know, you want to become a warrant officer, and you've uh, you progressed uh, to become a platoon sergeant. You're learning more. You've had assignments in CONUS, assignments in Europe. About what time did you actually apply to go to warrant officer candidate school? I actually put my packet in in 1985. Uh, but at that point in time, I was in a, an assignment with the reserve. Uh, so I was assigned to Fort Dix uh, with duty assignment in Raven and Conley Road, so actually in downtown Philadelphia. So I had put my warrant officer packet in. It went up to the assessment board, but because of the position that I was in, uh, wasn't boarded. So I had to get a hold of Arthur to tell them well, you need to release my records to the active duty board so I could be looked at. But at that point in time, you had to put the application in. It had to go to a centralized board. You had to be selected uh, for the warrant officer training versus in the 70s, it was a direct appointment. Oh, wow. But it actually, in, in the long run, them holding my packet helped me uh, because uh, after I had started the warrant officer school for training that was set up seven weeks with the warrant officer material. It was called the warrant officer entry course. It was conducted at African Theory Ground. So at the conclusion of those seven weeks, they gave us the weekend off until the next phase. 
then when I got home, I found out that I was during the 1986 board was born 37 and was selected 37. Oh, fantastic. So I'm, I'm assuming that. Delay helped me. <laughs> Roger that. Understood. So when did you actually receive your, your warrant, Chief? I was appointed on the 18th of February of 1987. Oh, fantastic. So I, as a quick aside, when I was a, a young officer, I know that, you know, if you have a commission, you hold your commission, you know, from the president. Warrant officers are appointed on a warrant. Non-commissioned officers derive their authority from their commanders. Can you explain to me how, when the warrant officer started, that program started, you, you had a warrant and they were commissioning warrant officers as well. How did that actually come about? Well, there's a couple of studies. The first study was two, total warrant officer study. Uh, and it wasn't an easy process. So but it was, when we were appointed, we were appointed Warrant officers in the reserve. And so I, I had a reserve warrant appointment, even though I was active duty. Okay. Yeah. And so, and two years later, when we were promoted to CW2s, we were given a reserve commission. Okay. And then at that point in time, we could have applied for RA commission prior to being selected to CW3. But during that I'm that news. A lot of the initiatives that were happening were put on hold because they were going to revise the way the Army managed its runoff. So, as it turned out, I made W3, I was given the opportunity to uh, get an RA commission. So I am a full, I'm an RA commission officer, even though I am a law. Outstanding. I'm tracking. So once you received your warrant, what was your first duty assignment as a warrant officer? Wait, let me tell you that. Um, <laughs> left. I'm going to go back to where I was. I was in Philadelphia. I was with the reserve unit. I was a motor sergeant. You know, I had a, I had a great assignment. The reserves that I worked with, or, you know, they were part-time, but they were, they were good soldiers. They really were. Uh, but I my warrant officer and I go to a place called Bootsweiler, Germany. And Bootsweiler, Germany is stuck over the top side of the tree air and I was assigned to a Hawk. It's a missile system, Hawk battery uh, in the Netherlands. And it was not an easy assignment. They had never had a automotive warrant officer there. MTO changed. The reason why the MTO changed and authorized uh, automotive was called a conventional warrant officer. So you had two Hawk missile clacks, and then you had a conventional clack that could lead Bravo Biden. The reason the MTO changed is because the mission of the Hawk had changed. Initially, there were five Hawk batteries. They stayed on tax site, and they rotated from a known location to another location. They didn't have to move the battery. Well, the new system came in, every battery had to completely leave the pack site for the two independent fighting positions once they fired their missiles and they had to go to it. So they knew their, their maintenance program was going to get a lot more intensive than it was. It's different from a vehicle sitting still half the year. It is having a vehicle on the Autobahn three times, four times a year with live missiles. Roger. Yeah. So, and having said that, initially going through and evaluating the equipment, uh, within my first six weeks, I was not a very uh, popular person, especially with the battery commander, because I felt then, as I felt now, my mission is to make sure that the Army's equipment can transport soldiers safely. So I went through every piece of equipment we had in that firing battery and I deadlined the entire battery. And back then we had the old G4 and 24060s. So they were hard, hard copies. But I, you know, and I thought about what I was doing and I knew I had to have a plan. I just couldn't say, you know, your battery's deadline. There's nothing I can do about it. Well, now here, I'm giving you the sour apple. Okay, so now next is I have to give you applesauce. Right. So 
had we formed I say I we formulated a plan where over a period of time we're going to service the entire battery. And knowing that we had enough time before that first evaluation was going to take place. So we uh, formulated a plan. We got you know, all the parts that we needed for services, all the repair parts that we needed. Uh, using the warrant officer connection, used some folks that were already in Germany before I got there. I made a few phone calls to get some parts that were completely available. Uh, I got to tell you, the day after I briefed the battery commander, doing something to motorpool, I forget what it was. The motor sergeant comes out and he says, the tank commander wants to talk to me. I'm thinking, okay, is he on the phone? He said, no, no, Mr. Hill, he's in your office. <laughs> so, go in there and I report to him. Well, okay, well, I made, made a couple months, maybe, you know, I can go back to Philadelphia and be a motor sergeant again. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, he asked me, he says, you know, is this a true deadline report? I said, yes, sir, it is. The best of my knowledge, this is what your equipment looks like. He said, what is your plan to fix it? So he said, give my full support. He left. No? So that was good. But that, going back to your original question, that assignment was to me. We did have discipline problems over there being at a remote flight site. We also had terrorist care. We would move out to the field location, and then uh, the individuals who would stay back to the site, and we were on top of a mountain. Okay, so we were very, we were very desperate. And they, they would get phone calls, and they would get messages that you know, no, all your people are gone. 1,500 hours this afternoon, we're going to blow your barracks up. Oh my gosh! Now, whether that was true or not, those individuals in the rear still had the force protection. You know, to make sure that didn't happen. And uh, we had a weight problem uh, at that time. Not in here, we did have a weight problem when we had to deal with it. And unfortunately, there was no gray area in that. The soldier didn't sleep, the soldier didn't pass, put him out of the army. Uh, I, I would tell you that as far as we tried to get these young soldiers to, to get within the height and weight, we still lost some good mechanics because of that. Uh, understood. So you did this job. I'm assuming this was from 87 to 90, and then you went back to Fort Bragg? I think I was there uh, 87 to 89, and the battalion commander came down the, the firing battery. He said, you know what? He says, you're doing a great job here. He says, I want you to come up to the battalion, and I want you to take care of all of us. Thinking to myself, oh, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> So that was my first opportunity. I went from the, the firing battery to the battalion maintenance officer. So I was the battalion maintenance officer. We didn't have a commissioned officer or O grade in that billet. So I was not only the DMP, I was also the DMO, the, the battery. Yeah, we had, we had uh, five batteries at the time, and uh, we could tie in with that Spain Dollar Air Base. And our furthest battery was Delta Battery, it was 65 miles away. The majority of my time for the last six months, I was in that position. I was on the road, myself and my motor service, most every day going to each one of the firing batteries, finding out you know, what your maintenance posture was, uh, what we, you know, as a cell, could you know, help them with. Uh, we also inherited the transportation motor pool for all of the PNP vehicles that belong to all the batteries. They're my responsibility to make sure that they were maintained and uh, interact with the bomb holder. And uh, at that point in time, I was also put on an evacuation team where we would show up at the firing batteries in the middle of the night and run operational costs. Of course, all my stuff was conventional maintenance. Right. And the uh, ethical officers who would run through to make sure that the missiles could be ready to fire. It was, a, it was an interesting uh, end of the tour. And so when I left there, I came back to Fort Clark. And that's how you wound up with the Signal Battalion, correct? Uh, yes, that's how I wound up in the Signal Battalion. I came in and uh, went through senior air processing uh, over back behind the old PX over there. And my uh, W3 says, we got a perfect assignment for them. I'm thinking, I'll tell you something, I've been in this army long enough to know that there ain't no perfect. <laughs> so uh, I'll, get over, I'll get into 90 to 80 seconds. And I wasn't there. Yeah, 
a longer period of time before we ended up in the pool today to show that the small animal. When we actually got the four yard, my house was in, had not a lot of game. Oh, wow. I had left the wife at that Right, they rushed me through bar. That's another interesting story. Uh, black ass were looking at me, you know, I do look like I have some aging on. So he's like, he said, Pete, when was the last time you jumped? I said, well, it had to be on from the March, April time frame of 1978. He's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> said, yeah. And, uh, so they ran me through the bar in a battalion manifest of the uh, and I was able to get a jump on before I pulled over. Roger that. And so, what was the experience during Desert Shield, Desert Storm like from a, from a maintenance perspective? I mean, you're coming from Europe, and now all of a sudden you're in this high uh, heat, high you know, sand grit environment. It was great time. I mean, how else do you learn your battalion's equipment at the Sun Strauss? So, I had an opportunity. I, I, didn't sit back static. I had an opportunity to see how the battalion operated at each one of their outposts, what each company did, you know, how well they made their equipment when the when they were running, what they did during their downtime. So as, as far as that aspect of it, I think that was the greatest learning tool that the Army could ever give me. I never had any experience with the signal battalion whatsoever. Uh, I took that time and then I learned so when we did redeploy back to Fort Bragg and we had to go through MSC transition, pretty much knew all the other things. One of, the, one of the things that I have the ability to do, I don't know where it comes from, but memorize my vehicle. So by saying that, I can look at a vehicle going down the road. If it belongs to me within my battalion, I can pretty much tell you who's driving it by the way the operator is. Reading the PC equipment. Roger. And, you know, and I, I pride myself on that. That helps me program maintenance. You know? So, especially in drama battery, I could tell, I could look at an operator, look at a vehicle of an operator and say, well, you're not going to make it up that hill. He's not driving the truck right. But sure enough, that goes way up that other truck would go to the side, you know, get over there and be. You adjust a clutch for him and say, right, here's what you need to do. Uh, so fast forward to the Sigma tie you know, I have pretty much had a good handle on, on the equipment and, and the status addition of the equipment uh, when we finally do it. It was a, it was a great experience for me. Uh, for the reasons I, I think I am so close to the battalion today, the fact that I did get the opportunity to go over there uh, in that environment. And we became very we can be very close knit uh, Italian. Even though we were, were separated, uh, we still had that uh, time morale. We still had that brotherhood uh, signal officers, even though I'm not a signal officer. Uh, they, they welcomed me in, uh, and, uh, with few exceptions. Uh, I felt very comfortable in the job that the without me. Roger that. And you had a really eventful time with the Sigma Battalion, if I'm not mistaken, because not only did you do Desert Shield, Desert Storm, which is huge in and of itself, but that was the time of the Hurricane Andrew deployment. That, as you alluded to earlier, that yeah. was when mobile mobile subscriber equipment was fielded. So you had to swap out an entire uh, set of communications equipment while maintaining the ability to support the divisions deployable in 18 hour mission. So that must have been a very intense time period. Was uh, we had to carve out whatever whatever A no was going to leave, whatever we needed to forward deploy in that 18 hour, we had to carve those out, that equipment out from the battalion. And it actually it was completely separated from the battalion that was taken over the DRMO. We were given our own yard over at DRMO to, to keep that equipment there. So and we rotated operators from the battalion on a regular basis. Because we still had the PMCSS, that still had to be able to go in 18 months. Roger. The other side of that, everything that was left, we had to get inspected. We had to get classified. We had to get uh, disposition instruction. Uh, every every piece of equipment that was intact had to be turned in through the supply system. Uh, I got to tell you, though, I had a great partner, Captain Steve Owen. Uh, without him, 
uh, running their interference and, and taking care of the meetings and, and doing what Steve did. Uh, our job, myself and my NCO, our job would have been a lot, a lot tougher than what it was. But with him, you know, what he did, he gave us free reign. Uh, you know, we could go down to 780 seconds. We can arrange for contact teams to come up. Uh, we had a lot of generators. Uh, so we made, we worked out an arrangement to where 52 deltas, battalions, 52 deltas could classify the power generation that we had, not have to worry about going through the rest of the floor. Uh, we worked it out to where certain segments of each company, you get what was classified. As it was classified, you get rid of it. Turn it in. And another thing, oh, by the way, while we're doing this, we had to redesign the entire motor pool. They still they had to be completely redesigned because now we added a trolley company. Roger. In APAC, we didn't have trolley company. We didn't have any room. Uh, so it was it was pretty good because uh, I was given, I uh, got with the engineers, and the engineer says, all right, give me a plan of what you want. So I gave a rough plan of what we wanted that was going to be able to support the uh, four companies. They actually designed it. And if you can remember the maintenance tool that we had, the only difference is, is that you go back where the tour rooms were uh, on the back side of the building. We originally had them on the front side of the building. They were high tension, high steam uh, lines went underneath that area so they couldn't build anything on it. Right. That was basically the only change that the engineers did from our original to the No, tracking chief. So now we've kind of, I know you had many assignments as, as a warrant after uh, the 82nd, but we sort of have talked your career from the early 70s into the early 90s. So we're talking a 20 year period here. And this kind of feeds into the, some questions that I wanted to ask you. What were the, from the from your early career when you were leading soldiers at NCO to your later career when you're now a senior warrant and you're leading soldiers, were, did you see, and not just a quality difference, we've talked to that, but a generational difference, like how you lead soldiers or, you know, attitudes towards leadership, attitudes towards responsibility, or once again, was it a matter of establishing standards and then holding the soldier to the standard, regardless of what generation they come from? Why not front? Yes. Yeah. You, you, you have to, you have to give a soldier a standard to achieve. And one of the things that I learned midway through my career that every soldier is going to give you 100%. I firmly believe that in my heart. Every soldier is going to give you 100%. Now, what is Smith's 100% may not be the same as Parker Jones's 100%. Yeah. Both of them are going to try to give, they're going to give you that 100%. So you got to be able, as a leader, you got to be able to understand what that means to that soldier and, and how do you use that 100%. Roger. That, that's a really good way of putting that. Uh, another thing I found, and we haven't covered it yet, but after I left the Sigma Tide and I went to Bruce, Yes. I had another great assignment. Uh, the name of first team I gave, so I had to learn a completely different set of equipment. When I came back, I was given an opportunity to be an international commander uh, in the 80s. So, uh, one, one of the things that I learned is that air troopers expect hard leadership, they expect you to lead them. So, if you can't be wishy washy, well, I think we're going to do this today, or you know what, we have a jump and maybe we'll make it, or maybe no. Oh, we're going to run four miles a day, and we're going to run four miles in, in, in 15 minutes. If you can't make that standard, I don't have any time for it. Roger. But that's an example, unrealistic. But they expect the leaders to leave. They want you out front. Roger if, you, that. if you're doing PT, you got to be right there with them. The other thing about well, what else is going to do PT, well, 80 seconds from a private two story journal, you can do PT. Roger that. And our job as leaders is to is to set the example of show, especially at my age. I mean, I was I was the oldest one in my detachment. I still outrun some of them kids. And Roger. they expected it. You know, they didn't they didn't want you sitting in the office. You know, they, and that goes playing with the PT, that goes with on the floor. And we'll work on we work on sharing, I think. 
ไม่เซ็นซาเดียใช่ครับอันนี้นะนี่แม่ไม่แกรที่ไม่ได้ใช่ไม่ก็เซ็นซาเดียที่ตัวนี้ข้าวร้อนแล้วนั่นคือหน้าที่ของผมในวันนั้นและฉันต้องไปที่ห้องพักแล้วก็เปลี่ยนไปทำอะไรบางอย่างที่ทำให้ฉันไม่สามารถทำอะไรบางอย่างที่ทำให้ฉันไม่สามารถทำอะไรบางอย่างที่ทำให้ฉันไม่สามารถทำอะไรบางอย่างที่ทำให้ฉันไม่สามารถทำอะไรบางอย่างที่ทำให้ฉันไม่สามารถทำอะไรบางอย่างที่ทำให้ฉันไม่สามารถทำอะไรบางอย่างที่ทำให้ฉันไม่สามารถ No, that's awesome. That's the the, the paratroop ethos of leading from the front. That's fantastic. Yeah. So uh, uh, across your career, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but when I ask this question, it's taken as read that you know you lead soldiers, you provide them the resources they need, and they accomplish the mission. And it's about the team's accomplishment, and your soldiers' accomplishments. But with that caveat, what would you say your greatest accomplishment as a soldier was? Oh, yeah, I tell you, sir, I, I've been very, very fortunate. I don't like to talk a whole lot about it. But, but first thing that happened to me, of course, I was inducted into the Order of the Holocaust. Uh, and given the opportunity to be named by name for the G4, to go, I want you to work on. Uh, KPM 738-750. You're going to rewrite that manual, and I want you on the thing. But what an honor that was just to be considered to help rewrite the Army maintenance. Uh, Fly doctor, the same thing. Um, a phone call one day, it says, you know, rewriting this KPM. Uh, is your input to it. So, and at the end, in your field, the assignment that you have, well, how can we make this better? Or as one of the lieutenant colonels put it, how can we put this in mechanic force? No, so the, so the soldier can understand. Uh, and then, having done the work that I did for AMSA, I uh, was uh, designated a master logistician in the society of uh, yeah, engineers. That was the uh, one. And then recently, I was inducted into the uh, war That's amazing, Chief. Those, you know, those aren't standalone accomplishments. Like, nobody does anything by themselves. Okay? Uh, one, of the, one of the greatest accomplishments that, that for me, the self satisfaction is, is that uh, when I worked for AMSA in the position that I was in, uh, I was in charge of creating tableaus of this to the repair process. When the IMRAC got killed, The army didn't know what repair parts that they needed to maintain that piece of equipment. That felt that came to my do You think what do you think you can do with it? So I actually developed the first ASL, the inbox. Then the same way with the striker, it fully developed the ASL perspective as as a, as a model to progress to help build the ASL and the CAL. Uh, so there's a couple more platforms, but you know, to be able to get back to the solution. That 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 is what that, that made me feel. At least you know I knew that what I did is going to help that soldier get that piece of equipment off the battlefield, off the training zone, out out of the line of fire when they need it, right forward to right side. Roger that, Chief. I'm tracking. So uh, I got one last question for you. We'll come up to the end of our time here. And we've we've talked about your career from suit, you know, soup to nuts pretty much. Hit, try to hit the highlights. I am interested in, and based off your experience and what you're seeing today, what do you think the biggest challenge or threat facing the Army is today uh, based off your, your understanding? We have got to retrain our leaders. Our leaders have got to stand up and We have to stop being a social experiment. I've seen it my entire career. It's never been as bad as it is now. Huh? At least in the 70s and the 80s, yeah, they, they the army. The army came out and the army had some things that they wanted to and we did it. And it, it, it was good for the army, and I have no problem with it. What we are seeing today, the total lack of discipline in our ranks, within our leaders. So, if I were king for a day, but I'm not, but if I were king for a day, would take every senior leader, get midway through their career, okay, teach them how to be effective leaders. You, you know, 
It's like parody. You can't be the soul of a friend. Roger. You need to, you gotta, you gotta parent. You know, and they say, well, you know, we have all this off temple and we're doing the missions. We're doing the missions, but at, at, at what are we costing? What are, what are we costing our soldiers? Not training them, not leading them to run. We had a leadership, they don't fall in the 70s, and it really hurts. It hurt us and it helped us. It hurt us in a way that we didn't have leaders that we could go to. It helped us with two documentation doctors. We were able to run our unit. The leaders of the unit, real good ones, knew that. And they let us do our job as not going to be Sometimes that guy wasn't doing it. Sometimes we put soldiers out of the army because they didn't need to say do you have recruiting goals? Yeah, we always make it. I like to think so. We have the discipline. And the says, well, we're a different army back then. What the hell do I make it? How many balls and four years? Four years. We'll see him today. We'll watch one of the leaders. He just says, yeah, leaders who weren't afraid to stand up. And our leaders were not You knew where that line was. Soldiers are soldiers are soldiers. Politicians and so many those lives being popular. Don't forget that my uh no, chief, I appreciate it. I appreciate the answer. I appreciate the honesty. Uh, so everybody, uh, closing it out, I want folks to know if you want to learn more about what Mr. Hill is all about, he wrote this excellent book, Memoirs of a Combat Service Support Soldier. And it's a fantastic book. It's my understanding you can get this uh, through Amazon, Chief, correct? Yeah, correct, through Amazon, yes. So if, if you're interested in learning more about the uh, the Army of the 70s, what it was like being airborne back in the day, and from a unique perspective of a maintenance professional i highly recommend it it's a fantastic book it helped me uh create the questions that i wanted to ask chief today and chief it was a fantastic hearing about your experiences it was an honor to talk to you thank you for coming out today thank you for uh thank you for having me good morning roger all the way chief have a great one out here you too now